Let's say you download textures or 3D assets from a website and when you go to use them in your render engine, they just don't look nearly as good as the thumbnails did on the website from which you got them. What gives? Well, each render engine is going to do things a little bit differently, so understanding how to use the texture maps correctly is critical to getting great results. Today I'm going to show you how to use textures from a website called Polygon inside of a render engine called Keyshot, which is typically used for product visualization. I'm using assets from Polygon's free collection, so you can follow along for free. And if you do decide to sign up, you want to use my affiliate link down below this video. When you download assets like 3D models from Polygon, they actually have a texture pack made specifically for popular render engines. But in our case, Keyshot is not on the list, so we would choose the option called All Others. These will typically come with textures for both the metalness and specular workflows. When downloading textures, you'll notice metallic materials will often give you the choice to download textures for either a specular or metalness workflow as well. And if you're not given the option to choose specular or metalness, then you may need to refer to the texture file name to see if it indicates one workflow or the other. After downloading and unzipping the textures, you may notice some of the textures have the word specular or others have the word metal included in file names. When I downloaded this plant model, for example, you can see some textures end in the word specular, others end in metal. When creating physically based materials for rendering, there is a specular workflow and a metalness workflow. Each requires slightly different textures to work properly in the render engine. Most render engines tend to use a material created by Disney called BRDF, which requires textures for a metalness workflow. Keyshot, on the other hand, uses a specular model for its materials, requiring the use of textures created for a specular workflow. Before I import these tile textures, notice there's no specification of specular or metal in the file name, so I will assume these are made for a specular workflow. Another hint is that the word metal or metalness doesn't appear anywhere in any of the texture names. I'll start by connecting all the nodes with a mapping 2D node. This keeps all texture orientation and scale the same across each texture. We then need to set the mapping type to node on all of these textures. Now we can use the mapping 2D node to control the scale and orientation of all these textures and they'll stay in sync. The next two steps are where most people go wrong. They either connect the wrong texture to the wrong socket, or they don't know what contrast level to use for each texture. And I'm gonna walk you through this next, but to make it really easy, I made a cheat sheet just for you. This way you don't need to commit anything to memory. Just follow the link down below to the file vault, scroll down until you find the cheat sheet, download it and keep it somewhere safe, and then you can reference it instead of having to come back to this video. All right, let's connect our textures. In Keyshot, we're just going to use a simple plastic material type for this material. If you can't see the entire name of the texture by looking at the node, double click on it and you can see the full texture name and the texture properties on the right side of the material graph. We'll work from the top down, starting off with the diffuse socket on this material. The texture that goes into diffuse is called either color or albedo. Albedo is the same thing as color, but without any shadows. And since we rely on other properties to cast shadows in Keyshot, we would choose albedo if it's available. Now, Keep in mind that because descriptive file names can get really long, it's not uncommon for companies to abbreviate the texture name. In this case, color is abbreviated to C-O-L. The next socket is specular, and it controls how reflective a surface is. Either a specular or reflectance texture will be connected to the specular socket, depending on which one is available. I don't see a specular texture here, so I'll take the map with R-E-F-L and connect it to the specular socket. Next we have roughness, and we'll be connecting a roughness or a gloss texture to it. Roughness is the opposite of gloss, and both can be used in Keyshot. However, roughness would be my first choice. In this case, I have a gloss, so I'll connect it to the roughness socket. Then we have a bump socket, which will connect either a normal or bump texture to. Normal textures should be your first choice though, as they create way more realistic results. NRM, in this case, is the abbreviation for normal, and I'll connect that to the bump socket. Finally, you have a displacement texture. You'll connect that to a geometry node, which then gets plugged into a geometry socket on the root node. DISP is short for displacement, so I'll take the displacement 16-bit version and plug that into the geometry node. Now you may find that some of your textures include a 16-bit or a 16 in the title name. These textures contain more data and can produce far better results. However, because they take up a lot more space on your hard drive and VRAM in your GPU and rendering, they aren't always practical to use. So generally speaking, if you are rendering on your GPU and aren't at risk of running low on VRAM, I recommend using the 16-bit texture. 
but if you're using CPU rendering, then VRAM limitation does not apply to you, and I recommend using 16-bit versions of textures when you can. I'll go ahead and delete these unused textures since we won't be needing them here. Now we'll make the necessary changes to the textures so they look correct inside of Keyshot. Now in theory, color and albedo maps should not need to be changed at all. Polygon saves these in the sRGB color space, which is common for the PBR workflow. However, Keyshot automatically assumes all textures are in the sRGB color space with a gamma value of two. But the gamma curve associated with the sRGB color space traditionally is in fact 2.2, not 2.0. So you may want to make some slight adjustments to the contrast of these textures, which can be done in the texture's color properties. A value between 1 and 1.5 should be plenty. Everything I said about color and albedo also would apply to the specular or reflectance textures as Polygon also saves those in the sRGB color space. Now these next maps we're going to be using contain something called linear data. I'll link to an article I wrote on this topic in case you want to learn more, but the takeaway for you is this. When using textures that contain linear data inside of Keyshot, an additional step must be taken so Keyshot reads it correctly. As a rule of thumb, when working with PBR textures, you can assume that all non-color textures are linear. Common examples include metalness, roughness, ambient occlusion, displacement, glossiness, or roughness. These are all considered non-color textures. Because our roughness texture is the opposite of gloss, we actually need to invert this texture, which we can do with a color invert node. And because roughness is a non-color texture, we are going to assume it's linear. To get Keyshot to interpret this texture as linear, we'll go to the texture's color properties and set the contrast to zero. For the bump texture, you won't need to make any adjustments to the contrast. If you're using a normal map, make sure the normal map checkbox is indeed enabled. This way Keyshot will read the RGB values as vectors and reflect the light accordingly. You may also need to invert this texture for it to look right. I found this to be quite often the case with polygon textures, so I'll set this one to a value of about minus 0.5. And finally, because the displacement texture is also linear, we should set its contrast to zero. Again, if you have a 16-bit version, it will produce better results, so go ahead and use that. Now in our geometry node, we need to set the displacement height to a reasonable value, then press the geometry node button. If there isn't enough detail or the results look jagged, just reduce the triangle size and press the geometry node button again. So at this point, you've matched up the right textures to the correct sockets and told Keyshot which textures need to be read as linear. While your textures are now being used correctly, there's one last step that we can't forget, and that is creative liberty. Sometimes your materials just need to be adjusted to serve your rendering, and for me, this usually comes in the form of adjusting textures plugged into the roughness and specular sockets. I'll show you how to do this next. Let's add a color to number node to the left of the specular socket and then press C on the keyboard to preview this node. In Keyshot, pure white is 100% specular. So to get shiny tiles, we need to increase the output two slider until we reach a pure white. Output two represents the maximum white value. In this case, I'll use a value of 15. Next, I'll increase the input from value until I see some detail in the tile texture, which will give us some variation in how shiny the tile looks. Then I'll increase the output from value to make the grout a dark gray. This will be the least reflective part of the material. And finally, I'll increase the output to value until the brightest parts of this texture appear pure white once again. In this case, I had to go all the way up to about 200, I think. So, after that, press C to escape the preview mode and disable the roughness texture to see how much of an impact this has on our tiles. So now we want to do the same thing with our texture plugged into our roughness socket. The only difference is that in Keyshot, the black pixels of a texture will result in a glossy surface and the white will produce a rough surface. I'll increase the input from value until we see more detail in the texture. In this case, about 0.05 worked well. Then I'll reduce the output to value, which lowers the contrast a bit, resulting in a more glossy overall finish. About 0.3 worked well here for me. The same can be done for the specular value, but remember, white values will produce a more reflective surface while dark values will produce a less reflective surface when editing the specular property. And there you have it. That's how to use PBR texture packs in Keyshot correctly. While I used Polygon for this example, the same workflow should apply to PBR textures from most suppliers. Now, if you want me to cover how to use textures for a metalness workflow in Keyshot, leave a comment down below. 
And remember, download the Keyshot PBR material cheat sheet linked down below. It will save you from having to come back and rewatch this whole video. So until next time, happy rendering.